Welcome to another episode of the RAG podcast. And for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. Since early 2019, I've been interviewing the most successful and innovative recruitment owners to learn how they rose to the top of their game. In season seven, I'm going to be having raw, authentic and insightful conversations with agency owners, entrepreneurs, leaders, people across the industry. And I want to be learning about their ambitions, what's happening behind the scenes in their agencies today and their plans to navigate difficult market conditions. I'll be bringing you the latest and greatest recruitment stories every single week on Wednesdays at noon across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast on this week's show. I'm super excited to be joined by Stuart Fry, the CEO, and Lloyd Creamer, the CRO, Chief Revenue Officer of a business called Hallion. Hallion, a recruitment business, but also an IT services organization that managed the IT support and projects for global organizations with 1,100 employees worldwide. Headquartered in the UK, and originally a, a pure recruitment firm, they then grew internationally across Europe, and they've got offices in Europe and the Middle East. Um, and in this episode... I interviewed Stuart, who was one of the first employees, and Lloyd, who's only been there a few years. But these guys recently performed an MBO and bought the original founders out with the support of T20 Capital, um, one of the leading staffing uh, venture capital firms. Um, They went through a process to buy the original founders out in order to create a... Uh, an event of wealth creation in the future for themselves and other leadership members and, and employees. Um, so in this episode, we talk about growing a business that includes recruitment and IT services, pre- creating an MBO and what it took to not only find a, a partner, a capital partner, but also the process to get that done. We talk about the Middle East as a region to go and work in recruitment. It gets a lot of negative stigma and press, but actually, according to these guys who on the call... Sh- Stuart was in Dubai and, and Lloyd was in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. These guys have lived in this region for a long time and have amazing things to say about not only recruitment, um, but also the client base, the culture and, and everything in between. So if you're a recruitment business looking to grow internationally, looking to perform any kind of event or MBO, um, then 100% you should be listening to this episode. And like I said, I always say, reach out to these guys. They're, they're full of information and full of value. So I hope you enjoy the episode without further ado. Stuart, Lloyd, welcome to the RAG podcast. Great. Thanks, Thank you, Sean. Thanks for the invite. No problems. You, uh, you know, we, we were just previously talking off air about the, the temperatures in our environment. I'm in a, in a nice sunny Sheffield, which is hammering it down at 11 degrees. Lloyd, you're in uh, Riyadh in Saudi Arabia. And, um, and Stuart's in, in Dubai, I believe. So, yeah, know, we're not, we're not, I don't know who's more glamorous out of the three of us, but. It's probably me. It's probably me. Um, guys, thanks so much for taking the time out of your you know, busy lifestyle, busy afternoons over in the Middle East. Um, we've been talking about this for a long time. When did, Was it about 14 months ago, wasn't it, Lloyd, when we first spoke about having you guys on the show? Yeah, I think so. Um, good friend of mine kind of kindly connected, um, asked Dan Cox, who I think you know well, recently sat yeah, Edison yeah. Search. Um, and yeah, we were going through a a pretty significant period of time in the history of Hallian at, at that point. So I think we agreed, let's pick things up next year. And crazily, 14 months has gone past. So no. yeah, it's good to finally have the chat. We're here. We're here. Stuart, CEO, I'll ask you the open question of do the kind of bird's eye view piece. For people who don't know Hallian, who are Hallian? Numbers, headcount, yep. location, services. And then we'll go back and tell more of the story. Yeah, great, great. Uh, I, I get used to doing this pitch with clients, so I, I can reel it off with no problems. Awesome. So having was formed back in 1996 by two guys from uh, Deck Digital. Um, started initially as a contract recruitment company out of uh, Reading. Um, and then the, the business evolved and grew quite considerably in Europe. And the reason being was that, that Halleen's biggest client was Sun Microsystems. And uh, Sun asked Hallian to follow them into all these all these different territories. Um, I joined Hallian in 2008, uh, and in 2009 set up our Middle East operation, which which really was the the transformative part of the business. Um, you know, we came out here, and now we've got a, a massive setup all the way across across the Middle East. Um, our business has really really grown because we're. I, I, 
I hate saying it, we're not a traditional recruitment company mm -hmm. because every every recruitment agency out there says, oh, yeah, we're unique in one way or another. Because um, we really care about us, our people. Uh, that's why. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the genuine yeah. USP in the industry. We, we, I actually, we care. Like, we, we don't spray and pray. We care. But yeah. uh, I believe you've got a little bit more of a real USP than that one. <laughs> Absolutely. So we, we've got a business. We, we rebranded it uh, two years ago to Smart Services. But effectively, what we do is we run large scale uh, operational managed services for our customers. So um, with one of the large European banks, we run all their IT operations as a fixed price. So we have SLAs, KPIs, penalties, service delivery managers. So it's, it's similar to what you get in a, in a systems integrator. Um, we do the same in the Middle East. We work with um, people at Oracle Health, where we have 100 people running uh, all the um, healthcare applications in hospitals. We have another 200 people with um, uh, Orange, where we run smart classrooms in the Middle East. So we have service desk, asset management, field services, running all these smart classrooms. And these are not, you know, five people or 10 people. They're 50, 100, 200 people on three, five, seven, 13 year uh, contracts. So for us, we've got probably 45% of our, our group revenues come from smart services. So when we're looking at our business, we can we can see a future view of the business years ahead. So we know, great, we've got 10, 10 smart services that we're running and we've got whatever, 10 million pounds worth of GP book next year already because of those services. So when we're looking at our investments, where we're going to go next, what countries we're going to go to, what salespeople we're going to hire, what technologies we're going to invest into, we're doing it on a, a really strong, solid foundation rather than hoping that PERM doesn't drop off or expecting that we'll do you know, 30 con you know, net new contract growth a month. So it gives us the ability to really, really have that future vision of our, of our business. Well, that, I mean, obviously, my background recruiting in the business change and transformation space in technology markets, you know, it's like you say, PwC, EY, Cogn Cogn is it Cognizant? There's yep. um, Capgemini. There's all these different organizations that, that do that. And then I found there's been a lot of recruitment firms that say they do it, but they don't really do it. Like they talk about yep. the scheme of work projects and they might hire one program director and put him on a some kind of, you know, retainer and try and fire him out and he can work out a time and materials project. But it's, it's not been done very well across the industry. Mm. How long has the, you know, how long has the business been in, been in that? part of the market and 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 was it a organic growth or was it an, like a buy you know the acquired or merged or something with an existing organization yeah it, it was an interesting interesting scenario so um we ran uh, a service alongside sun microsystems in in the in luxembourg and when oracle bought sun they looked at that contract and said it's not really what we do it doesn't tie into software or licenses or any of those things so you can have it so we, we all of a sudden got another 25 people and we're running a service because Oracle didn't want it. So then what we did is we learned, learned the hard way very, very quickly how to run a service and how you need service delivery management. You can't use free, you know, just freelancers. You've got to have a, a strong employed workforce behind you. And after we did that, we, we got referred into other businesses, especially in Luxembourg, uh, where we run this project. And then that expanded, you know, over and beyond that. And I think one of the really interesting things with our business is we've got, I guess, about 1,100 people out on site as billable, billable resources. And over 80% of those are full-time employees, 20% are freelancers. So what we tend to do is we tend to look at customers where we can uh, either resell resources or where we where we see long term engagements with them, and then we hire people, and then contract them out to our customers. And when those projects are coming to an end, we'll then move them onto another assignment, and another assignment, and another assignment. That way, we can we get the the benefit because you know uh, you have lower cost in hiring FTEs rather than freelancers. Um, your attrition rates reduce because people tend to stay longer in full time employment than they do as freelancers. But we can also invest in the people. So if we've got software engineers 
and there's a new technology and we say, actually, we see an opportunity there, we can invest in those software engineers to upskill them, that we can then sell them, you know, get them engaged and sell them onto different projects in the future. Well, it's that classic contract perm debate, isn't it? Like, if you think about why, obviously, contractors can demand more money in most most markets, but not only that, they get that flexibility of, of different projects. They get to work in different environments. You know, they, they, in five years, they can assume so many skills. Whereas if you're sat in one organization, just looking at the same technology stack, it's probably not as exciting for a lot of people. Um, yeah. Going back to, so Lloyd, what, tell us what your role in the business is. And then we're going to go, I want to go back into the past a little bit after that with both of you and find out your kind of journeys to today. So, but Lloyd, what, what do you do in the business? Sure. My, my job title is Chief Revenue Officer, um, which is one that you don't actually find in many recruitment companies. And no. it's partly linked to, um, we, you could say, Americanized some of our job job titles. Um, and that's partly because of all the stuff that Stuart's talked about yeah. um, with actually competing against businesses that are often um, headquartered in the US. Essentially, I run our uh, sales and recruitment team outside of the smart services business. So our revenues Correct me if I'm wrong, Stuart, 65, 70% recruitment still, um, and, and the rest is smart services. So it's still a huge part of our business. Um, and I lead that function. So all your 360 recruiters, business developers, um, TA consultants, or, or resources, as, as some people call them, um, come under my remit. And I've got a sales leadership team across each of the different countries um, who then, in some countries, have a sales leadership team within their teams. So, you know, like Dubai, for example, we've got 55, 60 people in that team. So um, there's leadership structure within that. Um, I've been a recruiter for 15 years, so I'm I'm through and through learning the hard way in London. .NET um, London recruitment. Classic. Um, yeah, classic. Absolutely. So, what? How many people are in the recruitment side of the business? Um, the thing is, there's a lot of overlap. Overlap. So across all of our countries, it's about 100, 130, 140. But um, for example, our resourcing function, so our TA function is a shared service. So they'll deliver candidates into both the recruitment side of our business and the smart services side of our yeah, business. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's pretty substantial. And how many, what are the different locations? We've got 12 offices now. Um, so Middle East, we have Dubai, Abu Dhabi, Qatar, and Saudi Arabia, where I am today. Yeah. Um, and then across Europe, we have um, the UK, Greece, Luxembourg, Belgium, France, three across Germany. So we're Stuttgart, Hamburg, and Berlin. Um, but I think I missed any, Stuart. Serbia. Serbia, sorry. Outsourced development team in Serbia, yeah. Wow, that's a lot. Of, that's a hell of a lot of places to get to. So let's go back. So, Stuart, you've been with the business for, is it about 50, just under 15 years? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what was it like? Tell me, paint the picture of, of what the bit, what did you walk into? What was your role and what did the business look like then? Well, I started I started out selling advertising when I left college because I didn't get a degree and I, I wanted to go and make money. And then um, my dad turned around and, and saw an advert for a recruitment consultant. And this is back in the days where you had roller decks and you used to fax yeah. the client a CV. So proper, proper old school. And it, and it sounded really good. So I went, I went and uh, had the interview, got the job. Did about six months there. Did quite a few deals, and um, and decided that I was going to move to a, a company close to where I lived. So I joined a company in Brighton, where I'm from, and uh, and worked for this guy, very inspirational guy, um, you know, racing car driver, bodybuilder, recruiter, kind of all all all, all those things. And I worked for him for a long time, and um, and then I decided I was going to going to go out and start on my own. Uh, it was quite shortly after he told me that um, I wasn't a very good salesperson, despite me, uh, despite despite me billing more than anyone in the company, and and it was at the same time I asked for a pay rise. Um, so yeah, started my own company, uh, ended up with about ten consultants working for me, and the company I worked for and Halley and were were big competitors. So the two owners of Halley and kept knocking on my door saying, "Let's go and do something." And in the end, I said, "Great." So I became a, a shareholder of Hallion, merged my business into them. How long was it? Uh, how, how long had your business been running at that point? About eighteen months, two years. I had about okay. sixty contractors. Um, so I was really, uh, I was five minutes walk from my house. I was, it was really it's a lifestyle business. Money. Yeah, it was, and it was it was good fun. But the opportunity to join Hallion and become a shareholder was was too much. So I, I joined. 
ran the UK for a year and then and then came and set up the Middle East. And then I think just after we spoke 14 months ago, um, we completed a management buyout of the business. So um, I worked with the, the team at uh, T20 Capital. So Tristan Ramerson, Ian Munro and Jamie Webb to buy out the other shareholders, um, which was completed uh, this time last year. Um, and then quite quickly after that, we, we acquired one of their assets, which is a company called Start Group, um, mm -hmm. who, are, who are present across Germany, Belgium, um, France. And I've spent both the last of the six months- Both of their founders have been on the show in the past. Yeah, yeah. So the story's, um, the story's been told. Yeah, and I, I spent the last six months spending half my time in Germany and Luxembourg and half my time in the Middle East uh, integrating the business over, which, which has been great. But um, I've, got a, I've got my baby number four, so I've got a, a son who's one uh, next week. So it's been quite tough as well, spending 50% of my time away. But uh, you know, now we've got, got the business integrated, we're all on one CRM system. You know, we've got the new websites going live and, and all those kind of things. We've got the German team now starting to sell smart services. So it's been, been well worth it. So why, why, when you've got 60 contractors in 18 months and you're building a team, why do you then go and f m like merge that in with someone else when, cause that is some, I'd imagine you're going to be spitting out some decent profit. Yeah. Like you say, five minutes from home. Did you have, did you have any, didn't have any kids at that point? I imagine. I had three at that point. Three so at that point. I, um, oh. Yeah. I, I got, I got married quite young. Um, had three kids, learned my lesson and got divorced and then right. married a lady much younger than me who, yeah. uh, who looks after me now. So um, no, I had three, I had three kids, but the opportunity with Hallian was, I always felt that there's, there's much more scale with strength behind you. And um, I've always been uh, much more of a salesman than, than anything else. I've learned the other CEO skills over, over a nice long period of time. Um, and I felt that when I was running my own business, there's a, there'd be a limit to my scale. You know, the mindset of being five minutes from your house. Yeah, your wife phones you and says, do you want to come home for dinner early? And you're like, yeah, great. You know, kids come in the office at lunchtime and play around. You think, great, as a lifestyle business, this ticks every box. But in terms of exiting with a significant kind of wealth event, I, I, I couldn't have done that on my own. I couldn't have done that on my own. So when the opportunity to work with these guys came along, they had probably 350, 400 contractors. Um, I got a 30% share of the business, so I, I became a significant shareholder straight away. Uh, and so it was uh, it was definitely the right move for me at the time. Um, and I've learned you know, more in those 15 years than I would have done 15 years doing it myself. I, I can imagine that completely. What I'll get on to you in a minute, Lloyd. What, what was it about that significant wealth event? Why, like, why was that so important to you? I think um, I, I've, I've come from nothing. You know, people, uh, people say I've come from nothing is such a broad terminology, but yeah. uh, you, know, you have people who've come from council estates who didn't get Christmas presents to, you know, to me, my parents were publicans. Um, you know, I never asked them for anything. I saw how hard that they worked. You know, my mum my and dad would be up at seven in the morning work through till three o'clock, sleep for two hours, go back to the pub and work until midnight and then do that cycle again. So I, I lived above uh, the pub for a number of years and you know my, my relationship with my parents for a long time was you know, leaning out the window asking if I could come downstairs and eat dinner in the restaurant because they worked their fingers to the bone and they did it for um, you know, me and my brother. And yeah. I... You know, as soon as I could start to really understand what money was worth, I said, there's no way I'm ever going to be in the same situation as my parents where you know, work has to, you know, has to feed everything. Um, I wanted to be in the position where my work fed my lifestyle and I enjoyed my lifestyle and I could be a, a father and a husband and hopefully, unless Lloyd throws me under, under the bus, a, a good colleague and a a decent human being that I could go and do things to, to help people and um, enjoy life. But weren't you on the track to that? If you've got 60 contracts in 18 months and you're five minutes from home, you're on track for being a good husband, good dad. You've got the money that you, you ain't running a pub at, at, until yeah. midnight. Like, weren't you on yeah. track to fulfilling that? 
I think it, it would never have fulfilled my ambitions at the right. time because I was a, at that time I was a you know, still a, a fairly young guy, and like I said, I was really I was a real salesperson. So when it came to invoices out and debtor days and all those kind of things, that was all very secondary to me. Yeah. And I was always about the next deal. And I, I did actually have a situation with a client that um, that cost me about £60,000 where I did a deal based on me being a salesman rather than me being a CEO. I didn't look into the client. I didn't do my due diligence. I didn't do any of those things. In the end, he stiffed me for about £60,000, liquidated the company and sprung up a new business two months later. And uh, now <laughs> I'd spot that a mile off. Yeah, yeah. So there's ambition and there's also knowing yourself at that point that, you know, you were not the complete founder leadership yeah. team on your own. You were a really good salesman and actually partnering with Allian gave you the, the backing financially, the big vision, but also the people around you that could cover yeah. the blind spots. And yeah, all yeah. right, that makes, yeah. that makes a and, lot of sense. And just, just to add to that, Lloyd said exactly the same to me. So when I interviewed Lloyd, he said, look, I want to come here for a few years. There's things I want to learn. There's things I need to go and develop in myself. But my ambition is always I want to go and uh, run my own company. But I know I don't have all the skill set and the tools to do it now. And I'm hoping that coming here, I'll learn the rest of the bits that I need to to be successful. I'm interrupting today's episode to give you a message from our brand new sponsor. Now, this company are called Untapped, and everyone knows that Hoxo, through this podcast, I've, I've explained that we, we've built our team internationally, heavily in South Africa, okay? And I get questions all the time from clients and people who listen to the show, like, how have you done it? What was the process, etc. Well, I've partnered with a business that can ultimately reveal it all, share it all, and, and help you do the same, right? Because look, it's been a tricky year for the sector, and many of people through uncertain times have had to streamline operations. However, you know, accessing low cost resources internationally has proven to be a bit of a cheat code for some people, including Hoxo. But anyone who's tried it, like us, it's very difficult, a lot of work, process to get it right. So this company, Untapped, are one of the hottest companies in the market. They've helped Hoxo, they're helping our clients. Um, and they specifically look at companies in the UK, US, Middle East and Australia transition to using remote individuals and building full offshore sourcing and recruitment solutions. So they source talent pools from places like South Africa and the Philippines. Um, and we're talking about experienced talent here. We're not talking about graduates with no experience. This is like people with three to five years recruitment experience and integrate them into your UK team. Okay. So they work remotely, but plug into your UK team. Um, they put around 3,000 candidates per month through an intense four-stage interview and online testing process to find the top 1% or 30 people and secure these people for work with recruitment agencies like yourself. You know, all candidates are benchmarked against UK competency frameworks and the, the way in which you would hire in the UK. So we're not, again, we're not talking about cheap for the sake of being cheap. We're talking about international, experienced people just living in lower cost locations. So it's a really simple process if you want to work with these guys. You pay a deposit to kick off their search. They then provide a candidate shortlist in 14 days. And then you can put people through your own process to hire them permanently. Or there's a freelance option. So if you just want to try before you buy, they can employ them. You pay a daily rate and it's a freelance option. Untapped are totally transparent with all the salaries and fees. Um, but, you know, we're talking about you'll still pay about 70% less than a UK equivalent in that role. So it's a no brainer to complement your existing team to handle surplus demand and ease cost pressures. You know, if you're not using this to rip up your business and rebuild it with global resources, then you're probably going to fall behind eventually. So due to demand and capacity, they're only operating on a waiting list right now. So if you want to be part of their waiting list, go to www.tryuntapped.com. Okay, www.tryuntapped.com and check out their information. Make sure you say that you listen to the RAG podcast um, because they'll do you a very special deal as well. Right, go and check them out. Back to the show. So let's get on to that. So Lloyd, you were, I mean, we don't have to go into all, the whole detail, but you were you were working with Salt, you, were, you know, no Elliot Dell, Console, 
Mark Cohen and the guys. You've, you've worked with some brilliant people and some brilliant businesses. Why didn't you start your own firm instead of joining a, you know, a beast like Hallion? Yeah, still asking myself the same question, really. It's um, <laughs> <laughs> <that's> a fine <laughs> Good thing no, you're in Riyadh. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because Stuart's kicked me out to Riyadh. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, as you say, so worked for some pretty household names in the UK, went straight in, into recruitment out of university, did the whole Grad Academy scheme um, gig. I, did, I was at Stott and May, who you probably know well as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then Console, Mark and Graham, brilliant guys, learned tons from them and worked for Ryan Adams, who now is yeah. the, the founder of Signify, who are also flying. Mm -hmm. Worked with some brilliant people. Um, I, at that point, setting up my own business was not on the radar at all. Um, I was six, seven years in. I was in London, um, to be honest, in, just in the rat race, doing the hour and a half commute each way every day and, and not really exactly knowing where I was going, but knowing that I was earning some nice commission checks and enjoying Thursday nights out in London. So, you know, um, I, I was happy to crack on. And then um, Elliot Dell knocked on my door um, and through a mutual contact and said, I'm setting up in Dubai. Um, we've got a guy to go and lead it, and I'd like you to go out there and join and um, initially go out there to set up our technology practice um, for Salt. Came and did that, worked closely with Richard Smith, who's a regional director here. Did um, three and a half years there. And then that was kind of the point in my career when the thought of potentially going and setting something up um, yeah. was on the radar. I then did a year, which I won't bore you with the details on, but I did a year at a business that was effectively setting up a new brand within a business. And I felt that that would give me a really good insight into how to go and set something up from the ground up without having the risk. And also I didn't have the capital to put behind it. Um, COVID hit that business and my experience there was not a particularly good one and i um knocked on mr fry's door so we've got a couple of mutual connections and um i came and knocked on his door and one of the things that stuart's not gone into there is the the historical nature of hallian being a very services and contract heavy business meant that at that point in time september 2020 um there was no dedicated permanent recruitment practice at all um, there was the odd smattering of perm deals here and there that kind of came in organically, but there was nothing dedicated. So I came and knocked on the door and I was like, you've got this, this 13 years or whatever it was at the time, 13 years of experience in the Middle East. You've got all these contract clients. You've got this brand, trade license, people, and you've got no perm business. It's crazy. We can, we can do something amazing with this, right? So um, that was where I started out of the business. I came in to set up a perm function um my background being 90 percent um and then across 21 and 22 we built that up to i think we did 4.5 million usd gp um in our second year so it was, it was pretty good i mean obviously that really? was riding the riding the wave of covid as well yeah, but, it was a great it was a great um, time let's not pretend but that's still really phenomenal going into it <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we we took it from zero people to about I think we did we were about sixteen perma heads when we did that four point five million and we had some amazing formers some guys who was doing six seven eight hundred thousand um, USD so it was a great journey and then the opportunity came in to step up and lead the sales business across both sides of it so I was very honest with Stuart and said look um, I'll come in I'll build your perm business I believe I'll build you a good business and I'll leave that business there making profit um and adding fundamentally to the bottom line um and then i'm probably going to go off and set my own thing and we both talked about the fact that we would bolt in some kind of wealth creation event so that i'd then have a bit of capital to go and do that um i think we'll both be very honest that when the when the kind of two and a half year point came around and um we had done that that we both sat down and said right you know what's next because we, we were both very honest from the start that that, that, that was what i was going to do and it as it happened the T20 guys were were involved at that point and um, the MBO was about to happen. And what I essentially did was enabled uh, Stuart to create a future wealth creation event for me that I was looking for, but by staying at Hallier, which for me ticked pretty much every box that I needed it to tick. Um, I also do have a young family. I've got three and a four year old. Um, my, my daughter was born literally a few months before I joined Hallian. And I'm really, really big on being a present dad um, and making sure I'm around. And I'm not stupid that going and setting up something from scratch is, is you know, blood, sweat, tears and 15 hour days, seven days a week. Um, and by working at Halley and I can sit with my feet up and do two hours a day and get all the time I want for the kids. Yeah. No, I'm yeah, I um, but, no, but, but seriously, have... with all them offices, 
with all them offices at Hallian, though, that is, yeah, you'd have more time perhaps chained to your desk in a, in a startup. But like Stuart mentioned, you can do it. I mean, I'm in the the way I built. I'm in the garden, right? I've got this is my yeah. purpose built office, and I can walk in and they're doing Halloween decorations. And then, you know, after this, I am going to go and spend lunch with my kids, right? So and that's my choice how I want to run it. But you know, running a business with that much headcount, with that many offices, surely that's that's a big challenge to be present with the you know young family as little as three and four. It's gone through phases. There was a period um, back end of last year and early this year where I was in Europe a lot because we were going through the, the, we just finished the MBI when we were bringing the two businesses together and I was giving Stuart a fair amount of support. Um, and at the moment, I'm spending a fair amount of time in Riyadh, but you know, it's 25, 30% of the time. To be honest with you, it's less about that. And I, I'm big on quality of time with my kids rather than quantity. Um, and I might go away for a week, but then when I come back and I am in Dubai, I have time in the morning to go and do the school run and then I can be back in time to do bath and bedtime. And it's those moments and those periods of time that are actually more important um, than having loads of quantity of time that you don't you, you don't really value. What's it like um, having a young family in Dubai compared to, say, back home? What would you how, how how does that how is it different what you can do, the activities, et cetera, for people that don't know? Uh, for me, it's incredible. Um it's statistically one of the safest countries in the world, um, which is, is, you know, becomes a very important factor when you have kids. Um, quality of schooling is incredible. It's so multicultural. My kids have got in their classroom children from pretty much every continent in the world that speak multiple languages from multiple backgrounds. You know, next week they'll be celebrating Diwali. Last week they were celebrating something else. And a couple of weeks later they'll be celebrating Christmas. So people, my kids will grow up with um, a completely rounded view of the world um and, and i just love that i think that's brilliant um i also think that it's a fantastic lifestyle you know it takes me 15 minutes to drive to work 15 minutes to drive back i've got a park for the kids five minute walk i've got their schools a five minute drive and i've got pretty much every amenity i could possibly want um, and i'm lucky that you know i'm able to provide them with all the things in their lives that that they need and you know we're probably not quite as easy to come come by when I was young. So yeah. for me, it's um, it's the best place in the world to bring them up. And as much as I absolutely, you know, I'm very proud to be from the UK and it's still it's still home, um, I have absolutely no intention of taking them back. <laughs> I like that the final line. And where before we get into the story, what, where do you think your, where does your desire come from? So your, you know, wealth creation is something you've mentioned, mm -hmm. being a founder, you know, we all fall into recruitment. We're all got similar stories. Why, what, where's this desire coming from you to create something as impressive as what you're trying to do? Yeah, like, like most people, you know, Stuart said it earlier and said it, um, said it very well that I don't really come from a huge amount um, and everyone has that different version of that story. But um, I'm the eldest of six, so I've got a lot of younger brothers and sisters to look after. Um, we, you know, my mum was single mum for most of my life, so I was kind of de facto dad at home a lot of the time. Um, and really have taken the responsibility from a fairly young age to also help financially support the family. Mm. Um, still do that today. So for me, the driver comes from that family's everything. You know, my family when I was growing up, but now my own family and my kids and being a good role model for them. Um, but that's where it comes from. I was starting to earn money at 13. So the second that I was allowed to do a paper round, as it was back then, I was, I was there six o'clock in the morning um delivering papers and then at 15 i was cleaning windows for 25 quid a day and then at 17 i passed my driving like driving test and was doing six days a week cleaning windows and four days a week delivering pizzas and then, so it's just i i just had that um desire in, internally to financially support myself and then financially support others and um provide better things and that's that stuck with me the, obviously the problem is that you never I, I always say this to people if somebody said to me 15 years ago in 15 years, you'll be, you know, living in Dubai, you'll have two children, you'll have, you know, a nice house and a nice car on the driveway and all that kind of stuff and a nice watch on your wrist. Like, oh, I'll be over the moon with that. I'm happy. That's it. I'm done. And now I'm here. I'm like, no, no, what's what's next and what's next yeah. and what's next? Um, and the, the, the fire just keeps getting bigger and bigger and keeps burning. So that's why now, that's why I'm in Riyadh today. And because I know that for the future of Hallian's growth and my personal um, plans, the success of the business in Saudi Arabia is massive and it will be a huge success, which is why I'm doing the six o'clock in the morning Sunday flights to get out to Riyadh and grow a business here. Yeah, yeah. 
all makes sense. We'll we'll get on to this one final question because I think it's important based on the fact that we've all got young children. We, I mean, I'm not from money either, right? My mum was worked at Spa and my stepdad drove a truck, so we were just normal working class people. What I did a paper round for Spa. <laughs> My mum nearly chopped her finger off there. I've got real hor horrific memories of when she was cutting sandwich meat and nearly took her finger off. Um, but uh, that's a different topic. But what? how do we raise kids? You know, being business owners, leaders, living in Dubai, living in Saudi Arabia, living in wherever, living in, in, in a completely different environment with different financial um, access than we grew up. How do we raise kids with that hunger? How do we not make sure that our kids are, are going to be complete sponges and just live off us three and, you know, have you know, daddy will pay for it. Like, that's my big, I'll be honest, that's probably my biggest fear. Now that I've had a baby a month ago, I'm like, she is not going to grow up and become a complete wet yeah. lettuce. <laughs> but how is the question? I don't know the answer. But have you guys got any I'll, idea? I'll, I'll, I'll jump in and start with, because I'm, I'm fortunate I've got older and younger kids. So my eldest mm. is 19. Um, she, uh, she did her A-levels, didn't want to go to university, working as a, a barmaid in a green grocer and doing all that stuff. So um, T20 kindly jumped in and gave her a marketing apprenticeship. So she's now mm -hmm. a marketing apprentice for the recruitment co. Um, and she's now working hard, really hard to, to earn her, you know, apprenticeship money. And she's getting the value of life and, and what it means to make money um and to be to be successful my my middle daughter is 17 she's done three or four work experiences here um in our office and she said she wants to get into into recruitment and i've said great finish your a levels she's going to get she's picked to get distinctions in in everything i said finish your a levels you're going to start at a thousand pounds a month and you're going to pay rent and you're going to pay your car tax and you're going to pay your petrol and you're going to pay all those things because you need to learn the value of money and you're going to start as a resourcer. And if after a year you can stick it out, you learn commission on the deals, but if you can stick it out and be successful, then I'll give you to Lloyd and Lloyd can train you to be a recruitment consultant. And if you can be successful there, work for me, work for whoever you want, I don't mind, but go, go and be successful. So I make sure all my, all my girls... They all work for their money. They don't get given anything. You know, they all all work for their money. And I think, you know, the one of the important things is your your children are going to see you working, and they're going to yeah. see the success that you have created by what you have done, because your success is all down to what you have done. And I think as long as as long as they see that, and as long as you're not saying you know when they're 12 years old there's 100 pounds a month pocket money and they're thinking great i don't do anything there's a car there's this 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 then they'll start to they'll start to learn and as soon as you can get them into work so they can see what you do yeah you, know, you get them in your in your garden while you're recording your podcast and where you do you know training recruiters to be more successful recruiters they'll say ah oh, dad works hard mum works mm. hard you know those things and and then you instill those kind of right life skills in them. Yeah, uh, yeah, I fully agree. I mean, obviously, mine are not mine are not at that age yet, but um, that's exactly the mantra that I'll be following. I think what it's easy to forget, Sean, is that you know you said your your child's a month old, right? The first few years of their lives, their brains are just sponges, mm. and they are they are absorbing absolutely everything that they see. So it was funny the other week. My my wife always complains that because it's it's like a constant candy shop in Dubai you go into every mall and there's 10 toy shops with every toy you can possibly imagine and um my son had seen something in a, in a shop window and said um mummy mama want that toy and and my wife said no not today Noah and and he turned around and said to her because money doesn't grow on trees and my wife was like where have you picked that from but it just goes to show that he had absorbed what she had said to her around money doesn't grow on trees and we, at three and four years old, my kids, they have a star chart on the fridge and they have to fill their star chart every week to get their pocket money. They, they get pocket yeah. money already at three or four because if they want to go and buy a toy at the weekend, they can if they've got enough of their pocket money. And in order to get their pocket money, they have to keep their room tidy. They have to help daddy do the dishwasher um, yeah. and they have to make sure that they all their dinner. And it, it's never too early. In my opinion, it's never too early to start those things. 
I also think it's really important to give them a lens into your life of work. You know, I, I travel a lot, at, well, as much as Stuart. And, you know, I don't I don't hide that from the kids. You know, I, I tell the kids, daddy's going away next week. Daddy has to go away for work. And you know that daddy has to go to work because daddy has to make enough money to buy the things you have and, and put the food on the table and have a nice house. So even though they're three and four, they know all of those things and they understand it. And I and I agree that, that with, uh, as with Stuart's, Stuart's children, that when mine get to teen years, hopefully they'll remember, even though they've t- touched wood, got nice things, um, dad worked hard for it. Um, and yeah. they'll remember that from an early age. Yeah. Well, I like it. I think we, uh, I, think, I mean, I've got two stepkids that are nine and 10. And and so I've, I've been living with them for two years and the change in them, in the we, we, their lifestyles completely changed, right? Completely. They go Dubai, they go, what did he say last? We went, for the last two years we've been to Dubai the USA and Turkey as in, in, in like a four month period. And one of the, like, as we're driving back from his football training, he went, sure. And I said, what? He goes, next year. I said, what? He goes, can we go somewhere different than Dubai, USA and Turkey? And I was like, oh, really? I was like, oh, really? Um, and then we had a bit of fun about it. But they're definitely, I'm, I'm working on that. We've got like, we don't have star charts, but we have the pocket money stuff and all that. It's all in place. But yeah, it's uh, take him to Bogner. That'll uh, bring him back down to Bogner, earth. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. What? So let's go into the business then. So if we look at this vision of wealth creation, can you tell me what that is? Like, can you give us as openly as possible? What are you guys trying to create? And I'll, I don't care who answers the question, but what is this North Star? And then we can talk about how we, how have you got to where you are and how you're going to get there? Yeah, I think. Um... It's it's always difficult, right? When you when you say what is your what's your north star, what's your end goal? Because it all depends on on what happens in the market and you know the success you have and your, your hunger and desire to do it. You know, I'm 46, right? And and I still wake up every morning at five o'clock and I'm excited to go to work and I'm excited to you know help people develop. And when you know, we do. Um, deal songs so we've got tvs around all our offices anytime someone does a deal you know and you you hear this deal song blaring everyone's standing up clapping and i get excited by that get excited by people's people's success so for me i don't think there's a a kind of end goal at the moment i think when i when i feel like i can't add enough or i wake up at six o'clock instead of five o'clock and go you know i'm not i'm not up for it that's the point that I think I'll probably look at, look at, um, you know, making a, making a move, but what we've done uh, and I've always kind of had this instilled in me since I started working is all the time you work for someone, you're an employee and any good salesperson, any good recruiter at some stage in their life will say, I've earned 25% commission on this deal. I could earn a hundred. Mm. So why don't I make the move myself? And that's why there's so many, one, two, three man bands out there in, in that recruitment space. What we've done is we've taken a slice of the equity and said, right, this is going to be spread out amongst a, a group of people that we think can make a difference in the business. So across the whole, the whole business there's maybe 18 or so people. And, and if we exit where we think we're going to exit in the future, that will range from half a million pounds to, three and a half million pounds. Now that gives people that the, the kind of starting money. If they, if they do that, say, great, I've now got, I've de-risked myself. because I've got a million pounds. I've de-risked myself. I'm going to put half of that away in a property. I'm going to buy two properties, invest or do something like that. But now I've got enough money to go and start up on my own. And that's what this will hopefully allow people to, to do because we have become, uh, I think Lloyd and I joke about it all the time. I think we're one of the best training grounds for recruitment companies. I think in the Middle East, we've got five five people out there or five competitors of ours who um, who were all started by people who who work for us here. Yeah. And I, I, I take that as flattery. You know, if, if people can come here, be successful, go and start their own business, then I'll take that all day long. And what... What's the rough time frame? Obviously, you know, no one's holding you to this, but like, what? When is that wealth creation roughly planned? When do you want to do it? I think in the next four years. Right. In the next four years, I think yeah, as I said, yeah, we've got got private equity, we've got T twenty, 
at some point they'll want to get a, a return on their investment. Um, private equity is usually a five-year cycle. We're, we're one year into five years. In four years' okay. time, they may turn around and say, great, let's do another five and let's inject some money in or do some more acquisitions or any of those kind of things. Or, or they may say, great, we've had a fantastic journey. We've grown the business really well. Let's all um, ride off into the into the sunset. And what what was – talk us through the journey then. When did this – MBO become an idea. So you were one of three uh, shareholders, yeah. was that right? Yeah, but the other two shareholders are uh, yeah, a fair bit older than me. And um, we we went through a process to exit the business um, prior to COVID, before anyone knew about COVID. And we got to the point, actually it was in the February, that I flew over to the UK and met the, the buyer. We were in due diligence. I met the buyer everything was great. I was going to stay on as CEO um, and I had a, a, a sweet deal to stay on. Um, and then on the plane back, I started to hear about COVID. A couple of people were wearing masks and then uh, and then bang, it hit. And, and their recruitment business was in education, hospitality, construction, <laughs> all the things, uh, aviation, all the things that just got absolutely battered. Um, so he had to pull out the deal. And at that point I said, look, said to mother, the, my two business partners who were our CEO at the time and our, our CFO, I said, look, I think we need to, we need to look at doing something, something different. So we, we threw around some ideas. Um, I spoke to, to you know, different people out there, the banks and all those kind of things. And in the end, um, I, I went to, uh, Ian Munro from T20. So I've known Ian for, for quite a while. And uh, and he's always always had an interest in in the business, and yeah, he was he was delighted, and and the T Twenty team moved really really quickly, jumped at the opportunity, um, and then we we got the the other shareholders the other shareholders out, and so what what was, kind of, what was going on in the business prior though? What were the symptoms I suppose that led to the the, the decision that actually you'd be staying, they'd be going? Like, tell me what was the what was the world like in the business before yeah. the original deal was on the table that fell apart. Yeah, I think um, hopefully our old CEO won't listen to this. And if you do, Levin, then I'll apologise. But, uh, <laughs> no, uh, you know, you, you get to the point that it, in, a, in a business, I got to the point that I was saying ambition's not there with the other guys. Yeah. You know, they're happy with 5% growth every year. Yeah, I, I, I wasn't. I wanted further growth, further investment, further development, um, you know, keep making that money, plow it back into the business. How can we How can we take everything to the next level? You said turn teams off, didn't you? My other laptop in the corner is ringing. So if you can hear that, I'm going to really apologize right. now and I'll uh, I'll tell whoever phoned me off when I, when I finish. But um, the ambition wasn't there by them. And, and they were, they were becoming just more switched off from the business. And, and I didn't want that. I wanted to carry on driving things and growing things. And that's why, yeah, we, we kind of looked at it. We looked at potentially me buying the Middle East only and splitting that out from the rest of the group. Um, but we, it, it was too difficult to unpick. So, so we went back to, to looking at a, a kind of full exit from those two. And was Lloyd, was that already on the cards when you, initially reached out to Stuart. So there's that the T2 or so the, the fallen through buyout was February 2020. I joined September 2020. So that had all happened, been and gone. I knew nothing about it when I joined. Um and then and then the the completed MBO T20 was last year. So by that point um Stuart had brought me into the fold. But just to mirror what, what Stuart said really when I came in externally um I came in through Stuart because we knew each other but I met with um Levin and Dave, the CEO and CFO, um, as well. Um, fantastic guys, got on with them brilliantly well. But it was very, very evident that the drive and the energy behind the future of the business was coming from was coming from Stuart, and that was all coming from the Middle East, um, because that was where Stuart was based. And when the business was set up here, there was there was no Middle East business. And then over the very long period of time that the Halley has been in the Middle East, it it caught up to and then surpassed the European business and. Up until we acquired Staff Group, the Middle East was significantly larger from pretty much every metric than the European business. So it was very, very clear that, that was where the, the fuel was coming from um, to grow the business. And 
I'm a, I've said so many times to Stuart, like I'm a, I'm a growth person. Um, Salt was all about growing something from the ground up. Even back at console, it was about growing a team from the ground up. Um, and it was clear that with, with what Hallian was going to do through, through Stuart's vision was, was significant growth. And that was what got me excited. And, and now the, the Saudi piece is all about significant growth. So I think, um, the, the the previous founders had built a fantastically solid business. You know, we talk about smart services, but it is one of the, if not the most robust businesses that I've seen. If Perm's down, smart services is up. If smart services is down, Perm's up, and you've got our standard contract business in the middle that's a bedrock. It's just incredibly solid business. Um, but it, there, there was this ambition to kind of stick rocket fuel in it and, and take it to the next level. And were the, the two others, were they based in the UK or Europe? Um, yeah, Reben, Reben was based in the UK and then moved out here. So he was out here right. for, for maybe six or seven years. And Dave was based in our, our head office at the time, which was in St. Albans. Right. And now, is that as, as, as the head office changed to the Middle East now? And is it? Um, well, no, we still keep our, our HQ as St. Albans, but um, you know, Dubai is our Middle East headquarters, St. Mm. Albans is our European headquarters. Um, but St Albans for us is really a, a back office. We we you know, we have a small amount of UK business, um, but nothing nothing sizable at all. And I think you know, when you look at when you look at where you invest your money, if you got if you got ten thousand dollars and you say I want to hire a salesperson, where am I going to put them? Luxembourg, Germany, or Dubai? at the moment will all net you much higher returns than London or anywhere in the UK. What's that based on? Uh, well, I think it's margins. You know, our, our average margins in, um, in Europe on perm, uh, are 30% middle East there, 18, 19%. Um, you know, our, con our, our smart service business, um, you know, we're netting 45% margin. So, you compare that to some of the UK businesses where people are working at five, six, seven, eight percent margin. It's just you just can't scale. You can't scale at that kind of level unless you're one of the the really big players. And what, for us, we've always kind of it diversified elsewhere. So when we look at our investments now, we'd have to go and do a UK acquisition to to really kick something off. Our trusted partner, Recruit Hub helps new founders launch their own recruitment businesses in the UK, US, and the UAE. The community is growing rapidly with over 70 founders on the recruitment platform right now. Everything you need to launch your own recruitment business with ease. You receive 100% of the fees you bill. You own full commercial control of your business and increase its value. You get cutting edge tech stack from ATS to sales automation. There's no admin. Handle everything from community registration to contracts to finance and support. There's no setup costs on the platform, no recurring fixed costs, and no surprise fees. If you're thinking of taking the next step in your career and want to discuss your business idea, please book a confidential chat with a recruiter team or learn more here. www.recruit-hub.com forward slash UK hyphen awareness. Okay, let's get back to the show. Obviously, recently I interviewed, you know, you, I think you guys listened to that episode with DSP, who the founder of Life Science People, ex Spencer Ogden, and he made a really bold statement that said he doesn't have any interest in the Middle East and you don't get paid, you don't get your money. You know, he was really quite yeah. dismissive, which is, you know, his opinion, that's fine. So you guys are quite the opposite. You know, you're putting a lot of your effort into the Middle East. You both live in the Middle East. You know, how would you honestly describe your experience of, transacting business what's different about the way in which people work and and is that whole quest to get your money out of clients especially in saudi is that as difficult as people say i, th I think david's um view on on getting paid is not not without basis right there, there is no doubt that the getting paid in certain um parts of, of the world is harder than others and this is probably one of the harder ones but if you're probably properly uh, ingrained in the local market and have relationships to a certain point then then it's far more controllable than i think a lot of people think um but the way of doing business is definitely different it is incredibly relationship driven um it is incredibly based on um 
I'd almost use the word pride of, of kind of local culture and the local the way that things are done locally. Um, more so probably in Saudi Arabia than than in the UAE, but people love the fact that we are a local business. We have Emirati employees and Saudi national employees. We are properly ingrained in the culture of the Middle East. We celebrate the culture of the Middle East, um, which I think people really value when you work with them. It's a very, very face-to-face -face culture, which is why I'm on a plane every couple of weeks. Um, because, you know, Teams calls and phone calls um, don't cut it here. You, you've got to sit down, have a coffee and um, white to the eyes conversations. Um, and that leads into helping you with debtor issues, right? Because yeah. somebody is much less likely to not pay you when you've had a coffee with them the week before and, and had, a, had a good chat about things that are non-work related. Um, I would say that the debtor days issue and the getting paid issue in Saudi Arabia was quite a significant problem, but in the last couple of years, in line with Saudi Arabia's Vision 2030 and the appetite to bring more global businesses to the country, it's improved massively. Because if be you're going to... Major, major problem, isn't it? Yeah, it's going to be a problem. Huge, huge. Yeah. You're not going to attract massive global businesses to come here if nobody thinks they can get paid. Um, so I, I, I personally don't see it as a... Well, it can't be a huge problem. We, you wouldn't, we wouldn't get a highly reputable private equity firm like T20 coming and and fund our business if we weren't getting paid by our clients, right? They, yeah. they look at this stuff obviously in pretty, pretty big detail. Yeah, um, yeah. Our, our debt to days are sub sub fifty days, which is which is good because we work with some of the big, big systems integrators and consultancies that have ninety day payment terms. Yeah. So yeah, we we have that that right mix of business. I think to add to what Lloyd said is, the 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 UAE government specifically recognised that bad debt was a problem here. And they set up a, a like a tribunal court in DIFC. So any time that you have a bad debt, we've had it where we've done perm deals, client doesn't want to pay. You submit your contract, the emails and the paperwork, and the judge makes a, a ruling. And we, I think we've been there three times, and every time it's been ruled in our favour. And the other party has 14 days to pay, otherwise they have their, their trade licence suspended. So right. it is... Is yeah, it is really good, really good for, for in, companies like in us. In the UAE, though, is that in Saudi as well? That's that's in the UAE, but I wouldn't yeah. be surprised if Saudi follows suit with something, yeah. um, you know, similar in the future. What's the relationship like between those regions? In like, are they friendly, and you know, does it feel very similar in terms of the way they operate? Um, yeah, very very strong ties. Um, there was a there was a couple of years where there was a. A little bit of fallout with Qatar and um, some of the rest of GCC, which you probably know about, but um, generally very, very tight. And there is a feeling across the GCC that it's a very, um, you know, they're very proud Arabic people um, with uh, and, and very proud of what this region is becoming. Um, but I would also say that despite the fact they're all geographically very close and they all follow very similar political systems and very similar um, religious beliefs, there is there is a tangible difference between each country you know like there, there there are tangible differences between saudi arabia uae qatar bahrain q8 which are the, the, the main ones that we spend yeah. time in you know which one you're in pretty quickly yeah wow and i think it's the same with the cities you go to riyadh you go to Jeddah, you right. go to Daman, you go to the book you go to even the uae you go to fujairah is wildly different than abu dhabi abu yeah. dhabi is very different than dubai yeah. And so it's really, yeah, it's really different across all those all those cities. When it comes to the weekdays, obviously Dubai recently changed, didn't it? It was like what two years ago they brought in the the Friday Saturday uh, so Saturday Sunday weekend as opposed to the Friday yeah. Saturday, but the set the other regions haven't, right? So how does your business work when you've got some people working on a Sunday and they're off on a Friday? How, how do you guys? Sure. We just gave one to work six days. <laughs> seven. Fuck it. Just get on seven. Yeah, well, um, why not? Yeah. You know? I think post -COVID, Don't give him ideas, Sean. Don't give him ideas. Post COVID, that's got to be an easier problem because a lot of people do. It's so fluid now. I think pre COVID, that would have been a genuine nightmare logistically having people working yeah. on a Friday and other people working on a Sunday. But how do you guys, how does that affect your business in any way? What, have you had to, what, what, what do you have to put in place to make sure it runs smoothly? Well, we've. Uh, 
we've kind of looked at that. Well, we looked at it when when we had those problems because there, there was a point that I was doing. I was working seven days a week. So we I was, we were doing work in Africa and Europe. We were doing work in Saudi, and we were doing work in UAE. So every day was a working day. I think when you've got salespeople that are earning commission, they're sitting by the pool on a Sunday, and they get an interview request in Saudi. They're going to jump on it and arrange the interview. So with salespeople, it's quite easy. With uh, back office and support staff, it becomes becomes more difficult. If you're yeah. doing credit control, you only have four days to do it instead of five. Yeah. In one of the regions, it becomes it becomes more difficult. So what we've what we've done, especially in Saudi, is we've invested in our own um, boots on the ground team. So if you look at most organisations, recruitment organisations that work in Saudi, they're based in another country and they sell into Saudi. They pay their withholding tax and that's it done. There's a, a handful of businesses that are investing in the country, and we're one of them, and that's given us the benefit that we've got a team there in those right time zones so the the need for those people to do that extra day in the week reduces down to really you know lloyd and my level and some of the sales guys that are selling in right yeah and i think sense. that you know particularly as Stuart mentioned at uh, kind of his and my level we are very very um cognizant of each other's family commitments and personal situations but and it goes both ways uh, this week's a perfect example I lost Sunday, um, my, which is my normal family day with the kids because I, I flew here. But I land uh, back in the UAE on Friday at about, about one o'clock in the afternoon. And I'm going to go home and pick the kids up from school. Yeah. And I'll be online if Stuart needs me or someone needs me. But I'm going to see the kids for the afternoon. And, and that, that's a conversation that doesn't need to happen. That, that's just an, you know, an unwritten agreement that we have. Like I know that in the evenings when Stuart gets home from work, he typically has his time with George um, with, with the baby. I typically won't call unless it's really urgent or I'll pop my messages like, if you're free, give me a call. So you just have to kind of learn ways of working to, to make sure that you understand people's sacred time, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, and, 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 it, and it does work. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that the Middle East weekend was, uh, well, the UAE weekend was was Thursday, Friday. Um, yeah. So the working week was even harder. Was, there are only three crossover days and businesses managed. Thursday, Thursday, Friday. What, when was it Thursday, Friday? Stuart can probably answer that question. Um, it's probably just before your time when the weekend was still yeah. Thursday, Friday. So yeah. it's probably 16, yeah. 17 years ago. And That's then fine. moved to, yeah, and then it moved Friday, Saturday. Yeah. And yeah. now it's uh, now it's easy for all of us. I know because the brunch, whenever I went to Dubai, the brunch was on a Friday. It was always like a brunch. Yeah, now it's on yeah. Saturday. Now, now it's a Saturday. Actually, it? actually, just, actually if you want to go to a brunch, you can go pretty much any day of the week. Yeah. You get day brunches, evening brunches. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. The, there was an interesting situation that we had to navigate though, Sean, which is probably something that other recruitment companies haven't really encountered apart from those in the Middle East, which the the challenge with changing the weekends was predominantly a religious challenge because Friday is the um, Islamic religious day. So a lot of um, well, Muslims will have an extended prayer time on a Friday. Yeah. So the challenge was um, creating a work day when there's a significant proportion of the day that has a religious commitment attached to it. So businesses had to navigate that. And most um, government, well, government sector businesses in the UAE simply clock off half day on a Friday um, so that they can allow that to happen. And what we've done is um, created a mechanism whereby people can either effectively work a four and a half day week um, and have a full day off on a Friday, um, or they have an extended, if, if they have religious um, commitments, then they have an extended break um, to enable them to, to to enable them to facilitate that, so you have to be agile and work work your business around it, and accept that we're no longer in the world of it's it's eight thirty to five thirty. You get an hour for lunch and a fifteen minute coffee break in the morning and afternoon, and that's that. You know, yeah. it's 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 a, it's a very you guys good office based though. Is it like as a, as an in, as a business? How are you approaching the return yeah. to work? You know, flexible working. What's the policy? Yeah, we've I got did, a. Uh, I'll, 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 I did. I did a talk at Jitex on this. So we were. We had a stand at Jitex recently, which is a massive tech conference, and uh, I did a, a panel interview about um, future work. And I think it is it is a, a really, really delicate subject. And I think it. What what businesses need to do is they need to look at attracting the workforce back rather than forcing them back. I think if you force people back, 
they're not used to it, they don't want to do it, and you end up having a, an unhappy workforce. If you attract people back, then people are happy doing it. And by attracting them back, it's not a case of saying, come back to work and you get, get some extra money. It's about creating that culture that, that makes people want to be around their colleagues and want to work. And that's one thing that Lloyd and um, Jack McCauley, our sales VP, have done exceptionally well is to, to create that culture where uh, people want to be here. Like the deal songs, um, we do, we have a spinning wheel for lucky dips for our TA consultants because traditionally our TA consultants, a lot of them from the subcontinent. So, um, you know, we do things like a skydive or a flight home or have a spinning wheel for cash where they can earn a couple of hundred pounds. And it gets everyone here and everyone around it. And when we're doing the spinning wheel, a lot of time the salesperson will say, oh, I'll double it, I'll double what you get. And it and that's part of the culture. That's what gets people back in it and excited to be here. And that's that that's I think that's one of the keys with our business. Other recruitment companies out here, you know, they say, Oh, you know, you come to work two days a week and do this, 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 and that's great. That's great. But collaboration is where success is born. And our teams collaborate really well because they're here and they're working together. But we offer that flexibility that if someone's on their target and they're doing well and they want to work from home a couple of days a week, great, go and do it. But we only reward people based on their what they're delivering. So if you know if you've got a lot of seniors, you know, thirty years old top billers that are having young families and want to work from home, but they're the people training the they're the ones on the phone that the younger gen are listening to. How do you how do you solve that? Because that's an industry wide problem. Right? It is. Uh, it is. We, look, I think we, we have a formal policy around it in terms of you, the amount that you can get work from home dependent upon where your performance sits. And everyone gets some degree of working from home. But we're also all adults um, and we understand that there's going to be times where a greater or a lower degree of flexibility is needed. But for me, it's all about transparency at the outset. You know, when, when we interview people to come and join our business, we're really clear that we are a largely from the office business. Yes, some people do have one or two days a week working from home, but primarily we are in the office. So we ask people to try their best to set their life up in such a way that they're able to facilitate that because it works just because, you know, it works well for us. I know, I think I'm right in saying, Sean, that you you guys after COVID went to full remote and are not well, going back to it. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I think, it works. I, it works I think for some. What works is sticking to something. That's what yeah. works. I think it's the businesses that chop and change all the time are the ones who've struggled. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we've we been very clear from day one that we, we liked it. We were like, yeah, we, we, we have no aspiration to be 100 heads and grow that way. So we're, we, we, we've built a business that works around it. But I think whatever the model, as long as you believe in it and you enforce it and you roll it and you're consistent with it, like everything in life, you'll be successful. Um, in terms of the final questions, because we, we, we are actually, you know, at the hour mark, but... UAE, I, I, look, I'm fascinated by the place. I've been, I think, 14 times. I'll be there in the new year. Um, I'm going to live there one day. That's my intention. But I've got to, the stepkids need to get to at least 18 before I can move and say to their dad, their biological father, but we're going and they might be coming with us. I'm not going to do that until then. But UAE is on my agenda. Um, what would you say to recruiters listening from other parts of the world that are thinking, you know, this could be, a, one, Hallian's an exciting organization, but also... I like the sound of the UAE, whether it be Dubai or, or one of the other regions. I guess what what would you what advice or what would you want to leave as a lasting bit of information? I'll I'll, I'll aim that at you, Lloyd, first. No, I think come and see it. You've been here fourteen years. Um, there is a lot of myth and yeah. rumor and misinformation out there about this part of the world. And unless you come and see it with your own two eyes and feel it with your own two hands, you you'll never really know. Um, so I highly recommend that people come and see what it's all about. Um, however, I also say to everybody that we um, recruit, particularly when we recruit, you know, relatively young, successful um, salespeople from the UK, particularly those that are, don't have kids and, and stuff like that. Remember that in order to facilitate the amazing lifestyle that the UAE can offer you um, with the brunches and the, the 365 days a year of sunshine and all that stuff, work's got to be going well. And a lot of people forget that um, and think it's just an extended holiday and think that we're sitting on the beach every day or we're at a brunch every day. And that's really not the case. I always have this on running thing. Whenever I visit the UK, everyone says, why have you not got a tan? 
I'm like, well, I'd spend, I'm in the office, like I'm, I'm, I'm not just sitting on the beach or, or sitting around the pool and working. It's a phenomenal place to build a career, but you do have to apply yourself like anywhere else in the world. And you do have to crack on, get your head down and, and work, work hard. If you do, the rewards are absolutely enormous. The speed of traje trajectory, in my opinion, is faster than anywhere. Um, the pace of progressing through your career because the competition is, is far lower um, it's far less saturated and your access to decision makers is far more tangible. Um, so you can progress at massive pace um, and obviously reap the massive tax-free um, lifestyle rewards of that. Um, but you do have to be prepared to come here as a career move and not just for a long holiday, <laughs> which is what which is what a lot of people try and do. Yeah. Stuart, anything to add to that? Yeah, we've had a load of success recently because, um, you know, in our hiring plans, I, I speak to I speak to so many recruiters and, and a lot of them say the bit that concerns them is going into a brand new market and selling from scratch. So we've we've got a, a team here. We've hired about eight people recently and they do they do their previous markets. We've just hired a guy who sells into Germany. So he's come here, he's still selling into Germany. We've got three people that sell into France and Belgium who have just joined. They still sell into France and Belgium. The only difference is they don't pay tax. Hmm. But they might have a different you know, working pattern because they have to start a little bit later and those things. But it allows people to, to have that flexibility to, to work here and tax-free, still work some of the markets <clears throat> they worked on while they're then growing you know, their future business and one of the most important things about being out here is, especially with Halley, and is you get a view like that. That's the Palm <laughs> Jumeirah. That's the Atlantic. That's the sea. Yeah. That's the Burj Al Arab. Yeah, it's pretty good, isn't it? It's pretty. And good. it's ninety-one degrees and sunny. So, like, I'd want to be here if I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know what? I mean, and and I can. I can totally agree with the the whole being there. You've got to feel it. You've got to go. And and you know the amount of people who say to me, "But you can't drink," and I'm like, "What do you mean you can't drink? Or you can't hold hands?" And all they come out with all these random comments that are just. But I, I've seen a change since I first went there about eleven years ago. It is different, but I, I mean, I I actually love it. I love the place. Um, final question is: You're not really mentioning the US, and that seems to be where everyone in recruitment focuses nowadays. You know, it's the golden chalice. Go out there, a bit like you know, Consol and Ryan Adams and all these. People you know have gone and nailed the U.S. and Edison Smart are mainly in the U.S. Um, you guys haven't talked about the U.S. Is that on the agenda? Is it part of the plan? This you know four-year plan, or are you are you the opposite of DSP and focusing in 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 you know in another direction? Yeah, uh, you, you summed up there that there's so many businesses going out to the U.S. to go and try and crack the U.S. and the market there is absolutely massive, undeniably. The market in Saudi is untapped is massively attractive to to a workforce because it's becoming you know it's got more western culture coming in there there's less mm. barriers to entry you get to earn your money tax free so a lot of people are now saying well if i go to saudi for two years yet yeah, i can't drink when i'm in saudi but i can get a flight over to dubai or the drive over to bahrain and have a beer at the weekend and it costs me hundred pounds for a flight Saudi's just massively untapped and they are they're crying out for good talent they're crying out for for good tech resources good digital resources and I'm sure you know Lloyd will, you know knows more than me when you go when you go and see a client in Saudi and they're a Saudi national they're proud that you have come to their country to do business with them and they're proud that you've walked into their office and they want to show you. I've had tours around businesses going from the mail room up to the CEO's office. But they're proud that you're there and they appreciate that you've come to their country to, to do business. That is massively untapped. And the growth in Saudi Arabia with projects like uh, Neom and everything that, that PIF are doing, that, that just won't stop. That won't Even stop. the Saudi Pro League, the football is yeah. attracting so much more, isn't Absolutely. it? You think about all the players flooding there. The, the attention well, it's attracting, the attracting the players, league. but it's not attracting fans. I think uh, no. one of the two, Jordan Henson's team had yeah. like 700, 700 people yeah, yeah, come yeah, to the game. 
thought that was funny, leaving the Premier League to go and we're playing for the 700. But, yeah. but again, it's more publicity for the region. There's more, more, more revenue going there. So is the US not on the agenda? Is that the answer? Not, not on the agenda in the next you know, 36 months. And, and I think the other thing, Sean, is um, people tend to follow the leader in recruitment, right? Everyone goes, oh, let's, at the moment, everyone's coming to Dubai. Um, and we're like, yeah, cool, come. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, everybody going to the US, we've we've obviously looked at it and talked about it multiple times, but we know what we're good at and we know what we excel in and we know what um, being first movers means because we were first movers when we did this properly in the UAE many years ago and it's very good for our business. Um, also, in, in honesty, just the logistics of time zones and travel and distance, you know, our mothership is in Dubai. And running a US business from Dubai, which is where all of our business runs from, is very hard. It's 12 hour time difference. I'm going to be in, um, I'm going to Vegas in, in two weeks for Formula One. And um, I've already said to my team, it's 12 hours time difference. Forget it. You know, it just won't be, we just won't be able to communicate really. So running a business out there. I remember when I worked at Salt and obviously they've got offices all over the world. And uh, in Dubai, we would communicate with, everything from australia all the way across to the uk but the us was really really hard you know to set up a call with a sales director over there was a nightmare and it would be 10 o'clock at night and nine o'clock in the morning his time or whatever so i think i think just also logistically it's, re it's really challenging and there's no reason why we need to force ourselves to do it just because yeah. that's what other yeah. people are doing. yeah i mean personally i i love one of the things about dubai is i love waking up getting a few hours to myself in the sun and gym or whatever and then and then can log on so i always do a week's work when i go there um whereas in the us i was in la last year for a conference and i went and met the uh, life science people and i met mark cohen and i was up at i mean i was wide awake at like 3 a.m and trying to it was just weird it was trying to work you i was trying to keep keep on the uk time zones so it was like 3 4 a.m i was up and trying to work as many hours as i could and then by like 1 12 1 o'clock la time everyone's finished no one's even replying to my whatsapps because they're in bed and i'm just floating around this city on my own like some absolute loser um so yeah Tough. well next time you're uh next time you're out here on a work we're not out here but in dubai on a working week we'll have to make sure we uh come, come well, i'm gonna be there for yeah week. i'm coming i'm definitely coming on the i don't know if i'm flying just before or just after new year so i'll be the first two weeks of january i'll be out there i'd love to come and see you guys Great. um Great. and look i'd love to get you back on again in you know 12 to 18 months time i think there's a real benefit and power of bringing people back on the show and listening to what they've actually like the guys at edison you know i, I got them at one point and then the, the you know they've now opened up in dubai and it's really good to hear the development especially if people are learning from organizations like you that are way ahead of, of where they are today if anyone does want to reach out and ask questions about just advice or they want to work you know they want to talk about working for you guys is it is a linkedin in mail or message okay because that's why i'm going to tag yeah. you guys yeah yeah 100 percent 100 percent. yeah yeah absolutely awesome. I'll, I'll be honest i'm nowhere near as on top of my linkedin inbox as my emails but my email's pretty simple lloyd.creamer at hallian.com so all, right. also more than happy to field inbox well we need to get your linkedin sorted out that's what i'm talking to your team about <laughs> yes you are i look forward to it <laughs> nice little touch um guys thanks so much it's been a pleasure um get back to your miserable lifestyles in that miserable weather and i'll uh i'll be looking forward to a halloween this evening yeah which is going to be sub 10 degrees raining pitch black with two kids dragging me around in the rain trying to get sweets from the neighbors i mean <laughs> you, 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 how jealous are you that's all i'm saying yeah oh, terribly thank you as always for listening to today's show i truly hope that you got value from it honestly it's the only reason i take time every week to ensure that my audience you guys future and existing recruitment owners you're learning from each other to make this industry that i love so much stronger and today's episode is brought to you by my business, Hoxo. I'm the CEO and founder, and we're on a mission to help brand recruitment agencies and their people better. I want to help people have the tools to stand out in the most competitive markets in the world. We're currently working with over 350 recruitment agencies and 5,000 of their consultants right now, helping them to build their personal brands to consistently win more business attract talent and just become that go-to recruiter in the market. Now we do have a huge coaching program, but a lot of people don't know, we also manage the brands of a lot of founders and we can do the rebrand of that company organizational piece as well. So if your recruitment agency 
either needs help to look and sound exactly how you want it to, or your leadership and consultant level need to get out there and drive more traffic back to that website, to the business and start using LinkedIn to generate more revenue, then you should definitely be reaching out to us. If that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean, a personal message on LinkedIn. I love hearing from RAG listeners. I would love to talk to you. Uh, Look forward to it. So I'll see you again next week with another episode. Catch you soon.